I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone to this space um, and this project known as This Red Door. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to give a brief kind of informal introduction to This Red Door and what it's about. Um, and then Chris Stackhouse and then Joan Walter-Math will give introductions to, to tonight's program. Will Will Longo uh, showed up um, as a special guest. I know that for, uh, Faruqi is a painter who lives uh, and works in New Haven, Connecticut, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Lisa Corinne Davis. Uh, over the course of nearly two decades, Lisa Corinne Davis has created a wide range of work from collage to drawings to paintings and sometimes a melange of all three. Ken Johnson grew up in Maine and graduated from Brown University in 1976 with a BA in art. He earned a master's degree in studio art with a concentration in painting. In 1997, he began writing reviews for the New York Times and continued to do so up until uh, September of 2006 when he took a job as the chief art critic for the Boston Globe. After a year in Boston, he returned to New York to write art criticism for the Times. In 2011, his book, Are You Experienced? How a Psychedelic Conscious Consciousness Transformed Modern Art is published by Crystal Books. There's Joan, Walter Math. Good evening. Um, I also want to welcome all of you and thank you for coming. Um, I want to especially thank all the people who are part of this Red Door who put their heart into seeing this event happen tonight. When Christopher and Jomar asked me to help them organize this public discussion, I took it that they were calling me out on my statement in Art Critical. Early on, when David Cohen stepped in and asked all of his contributing editors to take a position on what he called the Ken Johnson Affair, I acknowledged the importance of those who spoke out for what they found to be unacceptable in public discourse, and they were people on both sides of the argument. After reviewing numerous Facebook posts and on the online open letter, it became clear that further open and public discussions were needed to address this bleeding of the social body. It is my hope tonight that we can build a dialogical space where multiple and opposing viewpoints can coexist with respect. In this polarized political moment, if there's anything left of the avant-garde, we are charged now with finding a way to speak to one another from those vastly different points of view without determining one position to be wrong in order for another to be right or simply agreeing to disagree and negating the power of dialogue to move us. I'm not convinced that we should be trying to find answers tonight, but rather now, in the first of what promises to be several public discussions, that we should try to clearly articulate the differing positions and issues that have been raised in so many conversations, both private and in the social media. If we can figure out the real questions that need to be asked at this moment, we will have achieved a lot. It is my sense that those questions still need to be flushed out. I caution all of those, those of you who feel certain they know exactly what someone else has said or what they meant, and ask that you remain open to listening to other interpretations of those self-same statements. I ask all of you to choose your words carefully. The mixture of emotions and intellectual arguments, such as is the case here, couldn't be more difficult to navigate. Not to mention, nothing of significance can be attained when any party is speaking from a defensive position. I have a few observations and questions of my own that I'd like to share with everyone tonight before we get started. My first observation is that this discussion is essentially a response on the initiative taken in an open letter online that was written by Steve Locke, Dushko Petrovich, Will Villalongo, who's with us tonight, Colleen Asper, and Anoka Baruti, who's also with us here tonight. In meeting and corresponding with all five authors of the open letter, they made it clear to me that they were in no way trying to censor Ken or call for his head. Despite the strong emotions, 
and their individual positions within the group. When I asked Colleen to characterize the group's intent, she articulated, quote, a desire to start a conversation. We are all familiar with the sensationalizing tendencies of the, so of the media and now the newfound power of social media to mobilize. So I want to make clear that this is not a question of free speech, but a question of seeking a public voice to push back at something that has been interpreted as being unacceptable. I'm struck by the, the second observation I want to make is, I'm struck by the wide range of responses to various points in Johnson's now this review. The ambiguity, which has been characterized by some as sloppiness, has generated a discussion that is being approached from diverse perspectives. While many are quite certain they know what is being stated, many viewpoints are, nonetheless, at odds with one another. In works of art, we often prize ambiguity when it serves such ends, going beyond the original intent of the artist. My question is, can a critic productively work with ambiguity? In this case, has it served any useful ends? My third observation. If, three, if, the, if the theoretical developments of the recent postmodern era debunked the so-called myth of originality, why did the sentence, black artists did not invent assemblage, inflame so many people? How does it reveal a disjunction between critical analysis and the power structure of the art establishment, and therefore impede the important work of cultural communication that artists are charged with? Otherwise known as a crisis in criticism, where and how do we get to begin to unpack the complexities of this dysfunction? My fourth observation. Do shows that group artists together based on race or gender further marginalize those groups, or do they serve as a corrective? Do we still need them? Are there specific institutions where those kinds of exhibitions can be given a context that would serve the artists represented and not promote generalities like Ken's statement about, quote, the kind of art women tend to make? End quote. And my last observation, what really kind of grasped my interest in the now Dig This review were some cryptic remarks, somewhat cryptic remarks, I could say, about solidarity at the end of the now Dig This review. I would like to ask Ken to speak to the ways in which solidarity can work to reinforce disparity and the complex relationship that he seems to be hinting at here. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I'm now going to turn this over to Lisa Davis, who I asked to join us. I want to say that first, you know, again, thanks to Christopher Jomar and Joan um, for organizing this event. Thank you, Will, for joining us, joining us. I just want everyone to know that the world does change. Um, I'm happy to have the head of the Hopper School, Joan, the director of painting at um, Yale, Anunga, and myself, three women holding good ranks in academia. So um, I'm pleased to be a part of this group. Um, a lot of people feel that this debate happened um, <clears throat> partly because of Facebook, but I think that we must remember the great thing about this event tonight is we've all come together to discuss um, a, a hot button topic. And these things didn't just happen because of Facebook. These things just happen in cafes where the artists just to talk to each other and debate and throw things and yell and scream, have a drink, go home, and that was it. So um, then it went into magazines. You know, certainly debates have happened in the past um, over a very famous one, the Primitivism Show at MoMA, um, got debated for a long time in the, on the pages of Art Forum. And so um, now we're continuing this tradition of debate um, that started now on Facebook and will continue here in this room and I'm sure will go on past um, uh, 
way past this evening because these topics um, are, you know, hot button topics as uh, John has said. Um, I'd like to start this out with the general as a discussion and maybe move to more specifics. It is brave of Ken to come um, and have this discussion with us and so I hope we'll all keep a tone of fairness and politeness to him. But one of the things I love about this kind of environment is like we can think, and I do believe that art ultimately is thinking, and that thinking happens in different forms. Um, it happens by artists who go into their studios and think through mediums um, um, and engage in different activities, uh, that's their thought process. It happens through curators who are like the keeper of our cultural heritages and who um, interpret that cultural heritage material for people and they're responsible for that and translate that to audiences. And then we have critics, a uh, person that specializes in evaluating art and has a thorough knowledge, hopefully, of art history, forms and expresses judgments um, and uh, merits, uh, faults, values, or the truth of the matter in relationship to art. Um, the word sloppiness has come up already, and I think that there has been a bigger debate outside of this debate already out there um, in the pages of the Brooklyn Rail by Irving Sandler, um, who, who made a call for um, what's wrong with art criticism today. So clearly, art criticism and what it does and its faults are in the culture right now. But I guess. The, the way I started um, when I was reading about, uh, reading what Ken wrote, the, the Now Did This review, and in list, looking at the comments on Facebook, which have disappeared somehow, um, I really felt that I didn't understand um, the audience that you were talking to, primarily. Um, your concerns and objections or criticisms um, seemed to be more about the culture of the, of the show than the show itself. Um, there seemed to be a criticism or discussion on your part about the hierarchy in art making, and it seemed to be that your comments were directly towards what, the, what you thought the curator was or was not doing. Um, so I thought maybe that would be a good place for starting with your role as a critic in relationship to actually walking into an exhibition and what you were actually trying to say and who your audience was that you were addressing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, what was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I'm going to make it simple. I didn't understand what you were writing about. I, I really didn't. I didn't see a, I didn't understand oh, okay. what you were writing about. Sorry, when, when I, uh, First of all, that was when I'm often assigned museum shows to, or it's suggested to me I might do one show or another. This was one that I, that I wanted to write about myself. I didn't know really what was in it, I just knew what it was about. So I went to see it. And uh, over the years I've reviewed, this is over a 30 year period, I, I don't know how many shows devoted to one or another identity group, including black groups. And so that was one thing. So I looked through, I went around and looked at the show and um, it may be my fault, my short-sightedness, but I was underwhelmed by it. And I thought, um, there's, a, there's a routine that you go through as a critic that uh, I've been through many times. You go through the show, you determine what the shows about what it's supposed to be uh, doing, and then you judge it in those terms, and then you pick out work that, that you like or don't like, or, or whatever reason. And, and I just felt kind of, um, I could go through the show and talk about how I found so much of it just didn't excite me. And, uh, and, and then I thought, I started thinking, oh, I just wanted to do something different that 
direct, that addressed something about what was going on in my own head as a critic who's had to deal with these kind of things many times over the years. And um, one thing that struck me, and, and, and so, so, so that, so uh, Lisa's right, it's not just a, a normal, an ordinary review. And when I spot, submitted it to my editor, I said, you know, this, this isn't actually a, a, a regular review. It's more like what you might call uh, a critic's notebook. Uh, like it was an essay pro provoked by the show. And my editor said, oh, no, I think it's fine as a review. So I said, fine. So it appeared as a review. And uh, I, that's one thing I, I wish it had appeared as, a, as an essay, a critic's notebook. But, but anyway, um, what struck me about, what, what, it, what the show made me think about is something I hadn't really ever thought about in these terms, which was solidarity. That, uh, unlike, that this was a show about a group of, uh, I, well, I'm not sure if you would call it a group, it was about black artists making art in the in the sixties and seventies in Los Angeles. And most of them were actually all, all of them were working in some kind of mode that at that time was viewed as kind of avant-garde. And the strongest work or the work that seemed to me that had the biggest presence in the show was assembly. And and I thought, well, this is all very confident. Uh, savvy, sophisticated assemblage, but it's not like in my mind, if I think, uh, and, and, and Kelly Jones, the curator, pointed out in her article that, uh, in her catalog essay, that assemblage was happening in like, LA in the 50s and 60s uh, already, and when, when the artists uh, that the show concerns came along, they were, uh, adopting or taking on a way of working that was already happening. Uh, I made a big mistake when I said, uh, what I should have wrote is, these black artists did not invent assemblage. Uh, that might have solved a lot of problems. But, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, can I, like, why that's all the problem? I mean, what is invention in the have? to do with these arts. I mean, do you say, oh, would you say like, oh, you know, um, well, Rauschenberg you is some guy from Queens, like he took like assemblage from, you know, those Europeans. But you wouldn't fault him for that, would you? Oh, I was, I mean, that, I, oh, okay, that sounds like a fault. I don't know, it's just a, a point. But it was a big point. It seems. Am I, do, do you agree with that? Or? Yeah, I mean, if I could just um, interject here. I mean, for me personally, and I'm speaking for myself on this panel, um, even though I was one of the um, five artists who drafted the other letter, I can only sort of speak for myself because we didn't actually all agree in, in terms of <clears throat> our sort of disappointment and dismay with the reviews. I think we each had sort of different points that we were more or less dismayed about. Um, in terms of the black artists didn't invent assemblage. For me, personally, that wasn't the most, I was sort of willing to give that a free pass somewhat because I think I understood what Ken was trying to say, although he was saying it quite elegantly, which is that, and this is the point I think that Kelly Jones makes in the catalog essay, is that assemblage was a form that was popular um, in California at that time period. Not necessarily, I don't think she says who or what invented it, um, so it was a form that existed, and these artists were using an already existing form to present very particular ideas about their experiences. And I, I think that maybe that is what you were trying to say, but I think the use of the word in, you know, invention and the generalizing of the you know, black artists, it feels like a, a generality um, as opposed to a specific historical time frame or a specific set of artists. And that that's where you know my... Um, you know, desire to sort of respond to the reviews, both the now dig this review and the um, the preview text where the female gaze came in was because of, you know, I think anytime you look at a text or read a text, there are intents and there are effects. And for me, I, I separated out those two things in my response. So I wasn't at any point felt that I was attacking Ken's intents, but I was interested in responding 
and I felt it important to respond to the effects of the text. And the oversimplification that occurred, say, in that phrase, um, or in some other moments in the text were troubling to me. And because the oversimplification happened a few times in the text, you know, and so for me to sort of to think about what are the what are the, what is, what are the effects of oversimplification, and I think often that if the effect is a kind of affirmation of divisiveness. What are the other oversimplifications? Um, well, for instance, that you um, one point that you make later on in the review is what I call the empathy gap between the black artist and the, and the, and the non-black viewers. And you say that the work in the exhibition prevents a problem, or I think you use the word problem for the viewers of the show, because if you didn't experience those same experiences or struggles, they, they remain a matter of conjecture for you. Um, so some will identify with the work, while others will be sort of in this space, you know, distant space. And so on the one hand, that statement was sort of very, maybe very honest, because I do think that that social condition of the empathy gap does exist, and maybe you were also talking about your and others sort of distance from the work's concerns. But the fact that you sort of left it there and didn't examine what the empathy gap is, or you know, because for me the process of looking at art and the process of making art is actually inhabiting that space um, between interpretation and intention, and so it felt it felt like a, almost like a, a passive. Um, you know, uh, a passive sort of giving up of your role as a critic, um, and I, I don't. I'm not sort of asking for. Um, and so that, so that by leaving that sort of empathy gap unexamined, to me that was an oversimplification because we know that, um, for instance, there were many. Even if you look historically, many white artists who were engaged in, in and some of them included in the show actually were engaged in the civil rights movement and who were, you know, for whom that struggle was not just a matter of conjecture. So something to take that statement further as opposed to, to affirm the oversimplification and affirm the divisiveness um, it was was something that, that that's what I sort of wanted in the text. I, I, I guess um, it seemed to me I just want to point out I said if I am right that most of the work in Nadibus promotes solidarity, then this poses a problem for the audience. I, I want to just point out that it was framed, if I am right. So it, it is a speculative sort of offering to the readership. Um, it, now, empathy, empathy is a funny word. like. Empathy is something salespeople have, and politicians have, and even torturers have. I mean, it's, it's a neutral term. It's something you can, you can get in the head of another person for various reasons. It might be because you love them, but it could be in order to uh, inflict greater forms of cruelty on them. So I, I'm not sure what empathy means in this situation. My empathy in this situation is more like with the artist making stuff. And, uh, and my response to a lot of what struck me as being sort of cliched, um, like the one I picked up, the clenched fist. Well, and well, let's talk about the clenched fist just for a second, because this is, this is the part that, that about sloppiness that gets to me a bit. Um, you talk about the clenched fist by um, Riddle as um, a shovel. And you compare it to Duchamp, correct, in the review? Well, yeah. yeah, I think you did. And it's actually not a shovel, it's a rake. And it's not a shovel at all. That piece was a rake, not a shovel. Okay. okay, so. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that, but. Uh, <laughs> Have a copy of it, um, it's a, it's, and you seem to then go on because it is a fist to then make a quick connection between it and the black power kind of um, gesture. Right. And the black power gesture didn't happen until 1968 in the Olympics. That's the first time of the onset of that as a symbol. And this piece, 68, and this was made in 65. 
So I think that like when I talk about thinking, I mean when I go back to my initial statements about thinking and roles of critics and history, I, I kind of think Ken, that it's your responsibility to do that kind of legwork before you put words to a page because if you look, well, lay work of looking to begin with. It's not a shovel, it's a rake. And secondarily, to know the history of that gesture, of that symbol. Well, man, it's the fact that it's a rake. Because you compared it to Deschamps' shovel. Excuse me, can I say something else with this? I think that, from my perspective, and I'll talk for myself, um, the, the, real, the real issue for me. Um, and, one of, and, and I gotta say this, one of the reasons why I sort of declined to do this and then did it is because my fear of this conversation, that would, this conversation would be mainly about him and, and, the, and kind of the ego or career. And I didn't think that that was the best place to put this type of conversation. And so what I'm speaking now is that I hope that we can kind of register this in the right place. This is a total misunderstanding of a curatorial project. It's a historical curatorial project. Uh, when, Can we speak up a little bit? Yeah, I'm never mind. Mind. It's, a, it's a historical curatorial project. And just from that point of view alone, the article sort of misses out on that um, most important part of why that show has been put together. So, when you say, you know, black, black artists didn't invent the same lodge, and I'll go further, you back it up, it had nothing to do, uh, it had anything to do with years long struggle for freedom. Um, so there's more to that. Um, I think that it, it hits a core. Um, first of all, from a historical point of view, Kelly was not asserting that black artists invented the same lodge, or those black artists were inventing the same lodge. She was saying something more important. She was talking about a community of artists, a diverse community of artists, not black artists, but a community of artists working in black Los Angeles, which means a black area of Los Angeles, and being influenced by that culture around them. And that's a really important part of that curatorial, curatorial project. Um, secondly, when it comes, to, it still becomes about that with this issue of dismissiveness of the, of the show. Be, again, it becomes a total misunderstanding of that, of it. it's the correct way for cure for our project. And so the point of that is to miss, um, miss under or underrepresented parts of this narrative of American art. And, and, and it is, it's important. You love David Hammond, right? He's the only person in the show that you really love. Well, how does the David Hammonds come to be? And who tells those stories? For me, there were so many ways you one could have, whether you didn't like everything in there or you only like David Hammonds, there seemed to be lots of options in talking about this type of um, project, uh, which is a historical, corrective curatorial project. Um, and I think if one doesn't understand that uh, point of what of what that is, then you know, th th then you're kind of lost. Um, and that's my, I guess that's my take on it. Um, and I think that's why the emotions are hot. And I think that's why people um, who, who react in the way that they did because this is, uh, it's it's like these things are important acts of resistance to uh, to a uh, kind of. When you say a corrective, I mean that that story has not been told um, in effectively um, in um, art history. And a lot of the stories have not been effectively told. Or no, they're, you or they're you said underrepresented. Corrective. Corrective. Meaning, so, meaning, meaning, to, meaning to, to tell us there was a larger group of artists working in Los Angeles at that time who did not come to Ferris Gallery, and, but were doing really important work, and one of which came out of that community, being David Hammond, who is an extremely celebrated artist. Um, but 
we seem to look at canons that, as we usually do with so much black talent, is having some appeared out of nowhere, like a genie out of a bottle, when in fact,